Good morning. I'm Javi. We're doing Cheat Talks this morning. I have my guest ready, John Ford, author of Peace at Work. We're going to be talking about polarization. We're going to be talking about divisiveness, division, and um, remedies to mitigate conflict. Well, welcome to Chi Talks, where it's all about the energy. And if everything is made of energy, then we have a lot to discuss. So let's get started. Current events in the world at large are enough to make one lose faith in humanity. School shootings, illness, disease, political strife, and more have created polarization, division, and conflict. Perhaps mental, emotional, and cognitive well-being serve as conditional environmental factors, which may point to even predict events perceived as violence, distress, and disarray. When we use the Qigong lens and hold a space for pain messages to come into awareness from the body, we find opportunity to make friends with pain and often reestablish relationships that have, for some reason, been severed. How can we do this on the social landscape? Can we make friends with enemies? Uh, my first guest here is uh, John Ford. He's an experienced workplace mediator and soft skills trainer based in California who has successfully mediated hundreds of workplace disputes in, uh, since 1996. He's the author of Peace at Work and the creator of the Empathy Set, Feelings and Needs Cards for Emotional Intelligence and Empathy. In addition, John has provided soft skills training to thousands of employees at all levels in the workplace across a wide range of industries, including health and elder care. He teaches negotiation at UC Hastings School of Law and taught mediation to graduate business and psychology students at Golan State University from 2010 to 2016. He is a past president of the Association for Dispute Resolution of Northern California and the managing editor of mediate.com from 2000 to 2010. If you want to job uh, hop online, you can go to uh, peaceatwork.info or the empathyset.com to see a little bit of his work. I'm going to go ahead and bring him in and welcome John to the show. Do I have you? Are you with me? Thanks, Javi. I'm here. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. Good to have you. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey from lawyer to mediator. Sure. Well, uh, let's see. I was born in South Africa. And um, I think as everyone knows, certainly at the time that I was born, South Africa was at war with itself. There was apartheid. And in the bubble of my family, we were avoidant. And uh, so we, I didn't really see much displays of, of conflict sometimes hard figuring out how we make our life choices but the first way I suppose I engaged with conflict in a more conscious way was through the study of law and also through my conscience being pricked and being aware of the injustices that surrounded me at the time I was motivated to do human rights work and I moved when I graduated from law school to Namibia and uh, what I found though was as I was practicing as an attorney fighting the good fight, which I, I did identify with, I was happy to see Namibia transition from being occupied to being a free and independent country. But at a personal level doing my work, I was always struck by the ineffectiveness of the adversarial approach and the sort of just the, the, this, just the fighting mentality. And so both through uh, divorce work and also through labor work, I sort of gravitated towards mediation. I hadn't been trained as a mediator, but it just sort of seemed to make more sense to me if I could get the participants to talk about their issues and uh, work something out. Um, I preferred doing that. So that really was, you know, as, as I say, the big shift that occurred for me was from that adversarial mindset of how we approach the inevitable conflict that we all encounter in this realm of duality, if we want to put it like that. Um, and that I made, as I say, I made a shift to being a more collaborative, unity kind of focused um, practitioner who was trying to bring peace into the room through mediation. And I still do that. I mean, I still work as a mediator and as trainer, as you as you're sharing a little bit about my bio. Um, 
the only thing, and, and you also mentioned the empathy set, is that I've been focusing on simplifying and bringing the sort of the simple skills of conflict resolution to, to make them more widely available. So instead of having to go to see a mediator to help them to help out with their conflict, people are empowered to productively address their conflict on their own. Excellent. Well, the idea of the show um, today is regenerating the social landscape and you know let's let's just dive right in and talk about um the well well let's look at well let's look at the context and where we're at let's look at um polarization division can we talk about that how would how do you um see those what's your lens and then how has your your training and your learning um helped to you know, mitigate conflict yeah that's a well, I, that's just one of those, what I'd call those interesting questions, interesting topics, right? Because it really a lot depends on our lens and our focus. In other words, what are our beliefs about life? And are we focusing into the world of 10,000 things, the myriad of, of uh, representations of the oneness, or are we focusing on oneness? So in a, in a funny way, I think a lot of the, just the, the core reality of conflict is that we as humans socialize ourselves to and program ourselves to focus on the 10,000 things. So the, the external world out there, and we forget that, that 10, those 10,000 things are representing one thing, the energy of it all. And so when we become focused on externally in that way of the, of the things out there, there's lots of opportunity in the duality in the you know in the in the world for there to be conflict and um, but there's also always and that to me has been the more sort of the personal path around how I view conflict. There's always that opportunity of connecting with the oneness of it all. I, I know it's a popular image, but it really resonates with me. It's sort of that the idea of the waves on the ocean as opposed to or, or the waves on the ocean thinking that they're each individuals and forgetting that they're all part of the ocean. And I think for the most part, that's what we, the way we see humans in the world is that they're all thinking like they're the individual waves and they have rights and this wave that's coming in at them from another angle, it's like, hey, what are you doing? You can't mess with my wave experience. And we forget that after a short little period on this globe, we subside back into the ocean of, of oneness. So I think that, you know, to me, that at a, a sort of at a fundal le fundamental level is that we've forgotten that we are one. We forget, we forgot that we are, there is just this one sort of energy and we're um, misguided to focus um, as it were externally. But to the extent, and, you know, and certainly my career as a mediator has been focused not on having conversations with people like I'm expressing with you now, Javi, it's really resolving conflict in that more external realm, that you know, the world of ten thousand uh, things, and you know, there there are a lot of techniques that we and and approaches that we can use and bring to bear that help fo uh, folks to, I suppose, and I, to me, I think the opportunity really is to find balance in the extremities of the world. Um, in other words, to practice like you're talking about the social landscape as opposed to the physical. So thinking of Tai Chi as a sort of a physical art form where you're trying to main, maintain balance. Um, I think there are opportunities in the social realm as well where we seek to maintain balance in our, in our interactions uh, with, uh, with one another. And again, without always making those sort of things explicit, that certainly to my mind was what I was doing as a mediator, I was trying to bring balance, help people to see the opportunity for unity, even though they were more what I would call um, externally focused. Cool. This is great. Um, what I'm hearing is that the 10,000 things serve as the opportunity and point back to, I guess, truth and uh, truth in nature, which is the, which is the oneness. Um, and so for people that do not know, when we talk about 10,000 things, we're referring to the Tao Te Ching. And so the Tao Te Ching um, famous texts uh, utilized by Taoist and Chinese philosophy, um, written by Lao Tzu. 
The unnamed is hidden, a mystery, unknowable, oneness. The named are the 10,000 things that surround me. So the 10,000 things refer to the external world, whereas we also use that to honor the internal world, the yin side, if you will. So in our previous shows, we've talked about yin and yang. We've talked about, uh, well, let's say we've talked about wuji, we've talked about tai chi, and we talked about yin yang all in the same sort of context, whereas Wu Ji is that oneness. It's the plane of possibility. It is the uh, infinite. It is source. It is the, um, what's the other word? Insubstantial, if you will. It's emptiness. What the, the state, uh, the Qigong state points us to Wu Ji. It's what we're trying to find in relaxation when we do Qigong and Tai Chi. And Tai Chi is the energy by which yin yang are formed from Wu Ji. And Tai Chi is also the energy by which we return to Wu Ji from yin and yang. And the Chinese have, have for thousands of years distinguished uh, what's called the yin side and the yang side, yin jin and yang jin which points to the material dimension and the immaterial dimension. So we also talked about the, the monks and in the monasteries had practices that cultivated both yin side, yang side, spiritual aspect alongside the uh, material, physical um, skills and practices. And so I would say that there's an idea of what we call dual cultivation. And this principle of dual cultivation holds yin and yang in the same space. And, and maybe that can help to segue into the idea of dual cultivation in terms of partner aspect, <clears throat> excuse me, partner aspect and partner training, which you really get a sense of when you start to uh, take the principles into partner practice, which I think is huge for, um, martial arts practice, specifically Tai Chi practice. When you, when you start to learn and practice energy exchange, then you have yourself and another person who stands next to you or in front of you. And then you become the myriad of things, which then points you back to this oneness, which in practice you're trying to find. What, what do you have to say about, about that, John? Well, I was really enjoying listening to you, Javi. Um, but I think you're right. In other words, I think that's the art of life is how we dance together and move through through those um, aspects of duality of yin and yang and, and not necessarily identify with them, even though there's temptations to, um, through our socialization sometimes, you know, like say as men to identify, well, we are yang and the women are yin in a, you know, in a simplistic way, but just to be to bring that awareness of those qualities of energy that are interacting with one another constantly and trying to seek that harmonious uh, that balance. And as you say, to restore or return to the state of Wuji, that, that sort of, that which precedes the first step as you move out into the, into the world. Um, and, and again, so for me and my, you know, when I reflect on my my world of, as we're of work and I say, well, you know, I started out as an attorney. Well, there you could see the, the expression of yang energy and seeking to direct and to force and to want to you know fight for justice um, in, in that kind of way and again I think it's part, part part of what's tricky about being in this world is that is on the one hand there's this recognition as you're saying of that we are all from this one one energy the one one source and yet at the same time what we also experience is this constant um, uh, diversification and so that there is this constant sort of beauty in the change and in all of the new forms that uh, uh, that we see and so in terms of as we're interacting in the world as having to deal with that reality of duality even as we remind ourselves that we are all one and so when we you know when we look to that other person that stood on our toe and you say oh you know that hurt you did that to me 
on the, at a certain level, that's true. And our senses reinforce that sense of separateness. And that's my toe and that was your foot. And at another level, there's also an opportunity to discover that we're all that, that you know, truly that we all are, are one. But I think that what, what you're pointing to also in terms of just that, you know, pushing hands, in other words, that in, when we through practices like Tai Chi practice with one another and start uh, exploring what that interaction looks like and how we're sensitive to the energy of others, our energy and their energy. And again, in that interaction, seeking that harmonious um, um, outcome, notwithstanding the, the, the duality. And my, you know, my sense in terms of how, we, how we're living in the world is that we've, you know, in terms of our um, predisposition has been towards yet more yang energy in terms of domination and, and, and control and power over the, over the world. And we've uh, neglected the yin dimensions, the, the, the more softer, sensitive, and, and I don't want to say weaker because they're really, it's, it's balanced. So it's not that, the, you know, the one is um, less important. And so for me in my world, for example, when, you know, when I think of people in, in conflict, there's the need to express. So to me, that's the yang energy being expressed where they're saying, I have these feelings, I have these needs. And then on the other side, the receiving person who's doing sort of the push hands, the social push hands, is saying, I hear you, I'm listening to you. And they're not, because the minute they're getting, going into defensiveness, they're going into uh, more of that yang, uh, that yang kind of a posture. Um, but anyway, I, I think that's, that's part of the fascination of life is seeing the, you know, the energy at play. Um, and, and as I say, both the temptation to move in that direction of we're all separate and, and identifying with the world of, of things and forgetting that we're all, all one. And, and also the dilemma that, you, in other words, this is you were sort of saying to your audience, when you, we, we refer to the world of 10,000 things, giving the sort of the source context of where it comes from, as I've kind of discovered, we meet people where they are on the path of life. And so my concepts or my experience may not translate with someone else, in other words, to someone else's. So again, I think another important yin, yin quality in, in terms of our interactions is how we are sensitive to the energy of others and meet people where they are, also respecting where, where our energy is, but also being sensitive and trying to connect with the energy um, of the other and move from there. That's great. Um, you talked about push hands. Uh, for people that don't know, push hands is a uh, it's a Tai Chi concept, but also a, a, a physical practice, uh, a partner practice that reinforces the Tai Chi concepts. And it's also part of a, a curriculum. So a, a complete Tai Chi curriculum would consist of you. A lot of people see the Tai Chi form, the solo practice form. And that's what a lot of elders um, we find uh, have benefited from uh, in, in recent, in recent years. So we also have, we also have a meditation practice, which is part of Tai Chi curriculum. We have, because Tai Chi is rooted in martial arts, we have self-defense practices. And then there's also uh, pushing hands practices. So I think that's it. Uh, yeah. Meditation, Tai Chi form, the, the applications of the form and push hands, I might be forgetting something. So Push hands is very important because it brings the yin and yang from internal, which is the solo form, to external, which is now uh, interfacing with the external world. So that's what pushing hands is. Uh, great practice, super deep. Um, I really think that <laughs> everybody should be exposed to it. Uh, and that's, I think, what Marilyn's trying to do with the pushing for peace uh, practices. And then you also spoke about the exchange uh, and you talked about, uh, I think uh, what, what I heard you say was uh, the reinforcement of listening and following. Whenever you're practicing Tai Chi with a partner, the fundamental movements and the fundamental energies are listen and follow, listen and follow. You're constantly listening and following, listening and following. Um, 
while you're connected, which I think are huge, just foreign terms, I think, maybe to the Western mind, uh, to the external mind, in terms of uh, our social landscape, uh, business, capitalism, economics, and the predisposition, the tendency to be, as you said, young. So when we're doing these Tai Chi practices, we're a lot of times focusing on yin, listening, following, connecting, listening, following, connecting, listening, following, connecting. And so you're training these energies. They're, these are, they're actually called, uh, like listening is called ting, ting jing, listening energy. Um, well, following, listening, following, um, yielding, and redirecting. So these are all yin concepts, which I think point to the soft skills. Maybe uh, you can uh, expand a little bit on this concept and maybe it's soft skills and how you use soft skills. Well, as you're sharing that, Javi, what I was also reflecting on from my, you know, my own sort of limited, as it were, practice of Tai Chi and push hands, is you're right that the that we put a lot of emphasis on the practice as being a yin practice and that's and emphasizing that more sensitive um, the receptivity and the following. But I also know from having pushed hands with with a lot of people is that you you often encounter a lot of yang. In other words, like where people are trying to like get to you or push you. And then you think like, so where's the where's the receptivity? Where's the following? there in other words and so what to i think what often does happen even though the practice is seeking to guide us in that direction we can't get beyond our programming and our desire so as a word to um as a word to express express our aspect of the, the experience or you know to sort of to fall into the frame of this of competition and that somehow i'm competing with you and i wanting to win and get you to to fall backwards, um, notwithstanding whatever other. You I know, hear you. <laughs> you know, I so, hear you on that. Yes. <laughs> yes. So you know. So again, I think that's part of what you're getting at. So when we sort of, for example, when I'm exploring, um, say, the soft skills as a trainer, the soft skills are often, in the, at least in the world of training, are considered to be the hard skills because. They're not the technical, they're more the, the interpersonal, the how we get along. It's really the, just in, in, in a way what you're actually, it's the, um, the social reflection of what you're describing and push hands where people are discovering the power and the utility of being receptive and open and, and softer in the world. And that to get, to get places, even if, they, if we want to leave them with their ambitious goals to, you know, to to conquer the, the world as, as, it, as it were, that they need to um, show some softness. And I see this a lot in leaders that come in and have uh, Daniel Goleman, he's, I think a lot of folks have heard of him. He, he sort of brought emotional intelligence back, back on the map for us. Not that it was a new discovery because you know it's, it's been a topic amongst humans through the millennia, but he sort of repopularized it. But he, he would say, and leadership, there are six different leadership styles. And he'd say four of them produce positive effect. In other words, they're gonna generate more harmonious outcomes. And two of them, you, as he would sort of say, you pay the piper. So the positive ones would be the leader who has a, shares or engages people around a shared vision or coaches the folks that they're working with in, in alignment with their, their career goals that is more democratic, involves them in decisions that affect them. Um, is more affiliative and sensitive to the feelings. He says a, a leader that engages with folks in that way, which is more the yin side of interaction, you're gonna, it's gonna produce more harmony and alignment and feeling good and motivation and, and well-being. And then he also points out though, he says, but there are two leadership styles that are necessary, which would be the more like the yang ones, but you pay a price. And those would be the command and control and the pace setting. So, you know, the, so the command and control is like, you do it my way because I told you to do it. Your job is to just follow the instructions. Don't question me, just do what I say. And the pace setting is where you have something, you know, like urgent that needs to be accomplished. So, 
a lot of the times, and, I'm, and actually right now I'm working with a team where the leader has clearly embraced a, a sort of like as her dominant leadership sort of um, approach as a more command and control and pace setting. And so part of my job is to meet her where she is, because if I come in with judgment and say, you know, so I have to step to her side, meet her where, where her is and help her see the consequence of her style of yang leadership, if we want to use that lens, and invite her to explore the benefits of the yin. But for her, that's scary because it means giving up control and doing things that are aren't the same as being like, again, going back to the push hands where it's so clear, like, but aren't I, I'm, I thought I was trying to push you off your, your, so you could lose balance. Isn't that what it's all about? So that's, so I see that same, what you're sort of describing and that reflection of the, of the, the push hands practice reflected in my engagement, in my world, the social world of how to shift a leader who, you know, wants to be um, successful and isn't seeing how their um, socialization to sort of focus on a more yang approach is actually counterproductive and also, you know, basically counterintuitive. So yeah, so I'd say a lot of a lot of my world is trying to sort of in a subtle way make that help people to make that shift and to see the value of of more yin, more softness, more sensitivity, more awareness to the experience of others, and not so much about power over my way, you know, force, that kind of energy. This is great. This is Chi Talks. I'm Javi. My guest is uh, John Ford, author of Peace at Work, and he's a media, media, mediator and uh, teacher, educator of uh, soft skills, which is what we're talking about. And uh, you talked about push hands. We, we're kind of skirting along this concept of, of pushing hands, which we know, which if you're just tuning in now, we're, which is a practice of, of Tai Chi. And we're sharing our experience of pushing hands with other people. So imagine the, uh, comp com com the innate competitive aspect of human nature and you're standing next to a person that you don't know, and you're you're going to practice this push hands, this push hands skill. And typically, so what John was referring to is typically when you when you say you're going to push hands with someone, or someone wants to push hands with you, typically what what is what what it, what it is meant as is kind of a challenge, and the the challenge is is who can push each who can push who off balance first who can essentially destroy the posture uh and the root of the other person first so as to push them off balance this then communicates that if i can push you off balance i can control your energy at will if i can control your energy at will i can overpower you dominate um and maybe even kill <laughs> so um when John refers to pushing hands, I, I refer to pushing hands as a skill of, uh, of, of yin skills and as a practice of yin skills in listening and following. So in training, in training, it's a very yin training. However, if you meet someone who uh, also practices push hands, they're likely going to want to see if they can uh, off balance you because they've spent so much time in training center, balance, focus, uh, root and these energies, and they want to test that. So essentially, like John says, it comes to a uh, uh, combative and competitive uh, experience, which is not really fun. It's it's not really fun. So you really have to, I've learned, you have to distinguish, okay, are we competing or are we training? And, and in that way, both can kind of be on the same page. So this is what John's referring to. And uh he talked about uh, uh, leadership. So I really would like to expand on this idea of, of, of leadership because you're talking about a yin leader and a yang leader. And uh, so, so let's expand on that. I got to take a quick break. We got to do a little, bit of a, uh, a little bit of business here. So let's take, let's take a, uh, a second here. Uh, and stay with me, John, okay? Sure. All right. Well, let's try to pick up where we are off. If you're just tuning in, we're talking about the social landscape. If we're regenerating the, low, the social landscape, 
to uh, mitigate. Uh, and and th this is a call-in show. Anybody can call in. Um, John, are you welcome to, or are you open to taking callers? Maybe someone wants to ask you questions about uh, uh, polarization, divisiveness, and uh, conflict. Um, the idea right. for, the, for this show is to use these timeless uh, practices and principles of Qigong and Tai Chi and really and utilize them, bring them and bring them into uh, the modern world and make them relevant. Um, how are you doing this, uh, John? That's a that's a great question. I think it's uh, it's how I live my life moment by moment with awareness that we are energy, that I am um, part of a whole, a, a oneness, and that the, again, sort of that the, um, my programming has been sort of push, pushes me in that direction of separateness. And so to forget, to forget those sort of deeper truths about life. So I suppose in a, in a you know, in a, just in a simple uh, way, I, I'm, I try to live in my life with an awareness of energy in terms of just how I'm experiencing uh, life, I, I, I also am drawn to the Taoist orientation and Qigong and, and Tai Chi and, and the like, because where in the West we seem to have um, neglected or took us a long time until our scientists sort of rediscovered the energetic reality of life, uh, these practices, as you say, these ancient practices always recognized it through their direct encounter with life itself that we are um, unbounded energy. And so, um, again, as I say, as much as possible, I try to be, you know, to live a life of, I suppose, of balance with awareness of the, at, in, in the external world, certainly of the pull in the direction of, you know, when I'm moving in the yang direction where I can feel my yang energy sort of building and the need to some, in some ways, express that and then how do I find a way of expressing that but also not being so so um, unbalanced and so polarized that I'm just shouting and my you know I'm basically um, erupting in a in a in a volatile um, overdrive kind of a state so I think those challenges you know I, they certainly are alive for me in terms of just my daily life you know, it's also how I'm aware of what I bring into my body by way of food in terms of, you know, the energetic sort of quality of, of that. And I think the, the piece that I would sort of, which I've sort of seen, in, especially through my work as a mediator, as I mentioned at the very beginning, I came from a conflict avoidant family. And um, we, our family were not just conflict avoidant, but we would sort of emotions, really, the emotional realm wasn't really honored and wasn't really um, attended to. And so one of my big challenges in life was engaging in, in emotionality. And, and the way I think of emotion is energy in motion. So you know, when, when something happens at a very sort of basic visceral level, I, I will notice in my body, either maybe my breath has suddenly shifted or my muscles are, are, are tensing and my body's emoting. And so now I either have a choice of doing what I did as a little kid, which was being taught to suppress that, to hold on, don't let that energy flow. Um, and so that's been a big path for me in my life has been that sort of intersection of how I relate to my, the physical sensations in my body that are cueing, tuning me into what's going on in my environment and allowing in that sort of, in that sort of harmonious way, that energy to flow and also to get the information that that experience is bringing um, uh, with me. And so that, that's been huge for me, both at a personal level, but also has translated into the work that I do with folks in conflict, because almost always, you know, there's a cognitive conceptual in the mind aspect to the conflict of like how people conceive of what's going on and what should happen in a, in a mental construct way. But what I've consistently found is that the resolution doesn't lie there. It relies more in the heart of the matter and in terms of the feeling and helping the energy to move to allow the person's anger, which has been suppressed and blocked, to move. Because, you know, when, when people are angry, what I, what I, you know, when I was growing up, I was really scared of anger. 
And what I eventually came to discover was that anger tells me, well, when this person is alive, they're engaged, but they care strongly about something. And what they care about, their strategy to address and to get the result that they want is not working. And so then their body bring literally, they, their body brings them energy. In other words, it brings them energy to do something about it. But then they've got the social construct that's telling them, no, you can't express this energy. It's not you know, appropriate. And they put a lid on it and they try and suppress it and they hold it in their body. But it's not like that energy has gone away. It's still in their body. And so eventually something happens and it erupts. So when we suppress anger, we have to watch out for violence. Um, but in any event, so all of that, I, I know you started in a more, how do I relate to energy? So it was just to start from there, but really in terms of our conversation today, I'd bring it to that, to where I'm really bringing it is, is to say one of the most important pieces in terms of that regeneration of the social landscape is understanding and appreciating the value of the emotional realm and helping people to work with that as an expression of energy and to see how we want to allow that to flow and to get the message and to see that there are no really negative or bad emotions they're all just it's all just energy indicating to us how we're um, experiencing life and where we're you know as i said that you know anger tells us the person cares their strategy isn't working when we're experiencing sadness there's a sense of you know of loss there's there's something that they're they're either anticipating they're going to lose or they have lost a dear one someone close to them so that's that, that's a different expression of energy. And again, when when sadness gets uh, suppressed, it can not always, but it can lead to depression. In the same way, when we suppress fear, we often will lead to anxiety. So we so a lot of the the what I'd call the um, not dysfunctional, but sort of the unproductive expressions of emotionality that lead it to be labeled as negative actually come from the simple suppression and the not allowing of the energy to uh, to flow and so i just say now it's certainly in my life that's been a practice and as just partly because of the way that i was programmed and socialized to firstly open up to my emotional realm to become familiar with it to notice how the sequence from in my body experience the physical emoting in my body moves from there to me being aware this is something that i'm like sometimes what we call that, I'm having a toward response, I like it, I desire this feeling, or I'm having an, an away response, like I'm adverse to this experiencing, but from there getting to being able to um, identify what that nuanced feeling is. But even you see, as we shift from emotion to feeling, we're going in a more cognitive mind direction. And then with that, once we get into the, oh, I'm feeling shame, or I'm feeling jealousy, or what have you, there's going to be the, the mind's narrative about why this has happened and what should happen. And that's again where we get in, that's where things start getting dangerous. And that's where we get into, where we see people getting into their conflicts because you shouldn't have done this. But if we trace it all the way back, we discover at the root of that was something in the person's sensing body that the, where the energy wasn't allowed to uh, flow. There's so many things uh, to, to unpack here. Um, you know, uh, quickly, I wanted to hone in on this idea that the emotion is connected to the inside and, uh, the emotion is what brings you life. So interestingly, the, as you, as you noted, like an, uh, an emotion of anger can fill you to act where otherwise, if you are not filled with an emotion or, uh, spirit, uh, you would likely not act. So it makes me think of like a uh, very uh, a depressed or um, rigid state is what Dan, Dan Siegel calls it, you know, a rigid state, depressed state. And then, uh, and then, so you spoke about how the uh, emotion fills you to, in a way, um, activate and manifest the, the body and how persons uh, can eventually uh, act in a way that that is violent. But however, you're able to empathize and see how, wow, this person cares a lot, right? Um, this person cares a lot. It's difficult to see that. Like, um, you know, Marilyn, she's she's focused her peace games um, on schools in response to school shootings. It's, it's easy to see that 
it's easy to see where the hurt, the pain, the suffering is to kids and families who've lost life. And it's really difficult to see the suffering in the person who's committed the act of violence, who was filled with that anger, who was filled with that uh, spirit is really difficult to empathize. It's not necessarily cultivated um, in our mindset, in our mindscapes um, to, to empathize, if, if you will. Um, so I'd like to kind of look at how violence begins. You kind of, you kind of touched on this. Um, in terms of my practice of, of martial arts, um, hands clashing, uh, swords clashing, uh, weapons clashing, um, unrest in the streets. Like this is easy to see. You can you can call it violence. Uh, we can also like point to that as the myriad of things. But if we're looking at regeneration, we got to look at like the source. Like what is the source of violence? And I like to I like to utilize Marshall Rosenberg who. Uh, your empathy set uh, kind of comes from as well, feelings and needs. And I really look at how there's a progression of violence in the verbal space, in the thought space, and uh, in the thinking, in the thinking realm and how our thoughts and our judgments, Marshall Rosenberg really hones in on how judgment is a violent act in the, in the act in the mental act, in the yin space of judgment, he considers that a violent act where you can be violent to yourself and be violent to others. Can you, you want to talk about that or, or share something and um, maybe speak to leadership and the emotional Tai Chi? There's a caller coming in. So I'm going to try to take that caller and see if they want to get on air. Go ahead and call back caller. So should I respond first though, Javi? Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. So uh, with the, just in terms of that theme, at least where I'd like to sort of pick off is that piece around violence. Um, so I think one of the key things, which seems sort of, I don't know, in a way obvious, but I think it's always at bears sort of bringing to, into people's awareness is that emotion is not the same as behavior. And so we, we, you know, so a lot of the time, the reason why people will associate, say an emotion like anger as being scary and dangerous is because the behavior that flows from that is scary and dangerous. You know, so like a little child that maybe um, is uh, struggling to go to sleep at night and the parent has put it down and the parent goes and sits down in the lounge and finally picks up its glass of, you know, the glass of wine that it's been waiting for all day to have and takes a sip and then has this sort of sense that there's another being in the room and looks around and there their child is standing in the door and says, mommy, I can't sleep. And the parent gets up and takes the, ba the, you know, the baby to the room and puts them to bed again. And this, this little sequence plays out a number of times. And if you think about that parent, they have valid needs. They just want a little bit of ease. They want a peace and quiet. They've had a left long day at work. They've come home, they've cooked a meal, they've taken care of the family. And all they want is just a little bit of quiet time and their strategy to get the baby to lie down or the child to lie down and to go to sleep is not working. And so often it can be difficult for that parent in that moment of anger, frustration as a milder expression of that, say maybe on the fifth time not to, as they're walking to the room to grab the little child's arm and squeeze it tightly and the little child says, oh, that hurt, right? And so in the, in, to my mind, it's in those little interactions where we start to experiencing, for example, violence, in other words, a physical expression where we're bringing some pain to bear on, an, on another as a way of expressing our own um, emotional needs. So I think that's the, the first piece is just saying that. And then uh, the other thing which I, when I'm training folks in conflict resolution, I always point out to them, there's a continuum of behavior that goes into conflict resolution. On the, one hand, on the one hand, we have avoidance. We have people that will walk away. And that's, again, it's a strategy. And sometimes it's appropriate to yield, to leave, to allow, not to, not to engage. It's to know when to do that. And then I say, what's on the other far end of the continuum? And most of the time they forget us. And I point it out to them. I say, on the other end is violence. And most of the time, like you're saying, Marshall Rosenberg, 
as you uh, correctly point out, he inspired, he's inspired me greatly. And my empathy set of cards are based on his work. He's focusing on judgment as a form of violence, but that's conceptual, verbal, as opposed to, to uh, physical. Um, but I think it's, it's important that we, you know, sort of see both of those as being um, like as we, in terms of our language today, sort of yang expressions and problematic expressions as ways of harmon harmonizing the energy that is really calling forth to be uh, uh, harmonized. And that what to me, what, what, what the beauty and the wisdom of Marshall Rosenberg was he helped us to, it's almost like, you know, there's the five, you know, and you can share, you know, the five elements in terms of sort of Taoist sort of worldview, but in his world, he would say feelings and needs. So with feelings, we're getting to the emotions, that's acknowledging the energy of the, the experience. And that's, to my mind, is, the, is really the source of what's kind of going on. So we always have to, and that what I'd also say is a key um, understanding and conflict resolution, or just really in life is that, that feelings, emotions are there to be acknowledged, not to be judged, not to be repressed, just to be allowed. And the more we can acknowledge them, the better, in fact, the Gestalt School of Therapy, they, have, they call it their paradoxical theory of change. They say a person can change when you allow them to be what they are. So if a person's angry and you say to them, don't be angry, that's not going to help. They're going to think, you don't get it. I need to add some volume. I need to add some more examples. I need to demonstrate to you why I'm entitled to be angry. The sooner you can acknowledge and validate and allow, again, connect with, follow, allow that emotion that's where you're going to get you're going to find the, the movement and then it's also recognizing that in this realm of this our ten thousand things this realm of of earth here we do everyone has needs we have universal needs as life starts we take our first breath and when it ends we end with a you know an out breath so we all have uh, needs and being able to work with those two elements, trying to structure conversations so that we can allow the expression of emotion and discover the validity of the person's needs. To my mind, that's what, that is the, the way in which we avoid the, and the, and the uh, unnecessary expressions of violent behavior, because as Marshall Rosenberg would point out, people when they are violent are expressing their valid needs in an unproductive, unfor unfortunate way, but that they have at the heart of it valid concerns and they also have their true lived human experience that are reflected in their emotions. Thanks, John. We're going to take a caller and um, go ahead and answer the caller's question and go ahead and use that time for your last words as well as we uh, complete the sure. show. Go ahead, caller. Um, I just first wanted to, I'll try to keep this short. Um, Javi and John, uh, thank you for a beautiful conversation. I think you both uh, exhibit, you know, lots of wisdom. Um, I would also ask you to repeat the name of uh, John's book there. And I was just going to express, you know, for myself, I think my first instinct, you know, even as a kid, I think I was similar to you, John, in terms of how you described your family dynamics and perhaps yourself not being in touch uh, with your emotions as, or being able to express yourself as well as maybe you wanted. Um, so my, yeah, I often, uh, my violent tendencies or side will manifest very quickly um, and easily because I'm not as in touch with my emotional side, even though I definitely have a strong emotional side. Um, what I've found is that I, I've been thinking about it it's like when I open myself up to that emotional side, sometimes you end up getting hurt or burned, right? And so I think maybe people learn over time, like, you know, putting up that more uh, violent or uh, aggressive or, you know, the yang side of things uh, protects them, you know, from those that pain, perhaps being exposed to it as much. And lastly, uh, I just wanted to say, I wish there was a way to take your uh, and, uh, you know, your uh, people you draw upon uh, wisdom to apply it on, you know, a global scale and government and social scale, um, trying to get through people's uh, 
difficulties in basically being able to open up and listening and empathizing with uh, other people. But thank you so much for the conversation and I'll listen up there. Thank you both. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I, I can, I have to say that I, uh, I can uh, empathize with, with the idea of not having uh, a clear path or even an acknowledgement of emotional life in growing up um, and difficult to navigate uh, emotional life and such uh, and the energy of emotion as, as, as you walk through life. Um, so I've had to also cultivate those, those skills and have the uh, awareness of that as well. Go ahead and, and, and respond, John, and, and, you, and uh, give us your last words and your contact really, info. <clears throat> really appreciated uh, your listener, what he shared. Um, I think we're all on the path together. We're all, as the late Rodney King would say, we're all struggling to get along um, in terms of that sort of world, world worldwide dilemma that we still face in 2021 where we're so violent you know, I shared this with Javi the other day it's sad to me that probably today billions will have been spent on how to kill one another and actually killing one another and a very small amount of money will have been spent on the ways of, of relating in a peaceful loving kind uh, way and as long as we're pointing in that direction I, I'm afraid cause and effect is going to uh, deliver <laughs> deliver more of that, but I, but it's also always good just to connect with those that care and are seeking to change. And I think the opportunity to your listener is really to say, as we, as we look into the world out there, is to follow Gandhi's line, which is you be the change that you wish to see in the world. And it is, it's not easy and it, it does take effort to reprogram the wiring. But the beautiful thing is that we have that capacity with our brain's plasticity. And um, I think it, it is hard when we're when we try a different approach and it, as it were, backfires or we feel like we get, we get hurt or taken ad, a, a advantage of and it, and it prompts us or attempts us to go back to our well-worn protective patterns from childhood of saying, the way to protect myself is, you know, you hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you back. Um, so it's, it's, it's not easy and it takes constant vigilance and noticing. But I think one of the, again, my last sort of comment would be to say, that allowing yourself to have your feelings and a lot of that work can be done personally on your own of just allowing and acknowledging the truth don't try and bluff yourself that you're not feeling angry but try to dissipate that energy on your own before you come to express it so another way of sometimes putting it is we clean the wound out before we stitch it up so sometimes it's we have to do that first um, but that's again thank you for that call the, that sort of that caller I don't think I have too much to, to say other than thank you Javi I really appreciated the conversation just being able to connect and uh, share these ideas um, the, the tool that I would say I think your reader asked about my book the book was really more geared towards human resource managers and helping them to learn how to mediate and uh, what I'm most excited about though right now is my empathy set of cards because that's the most practical tool for getting people in touch with feelings and needs and giving them positive ways of expressing themselves. And I'll throw in another thing, which I think is such a under, undervalued tool, which is the talking stick. And that all you need for that is just to pick up a little twig outside or a pen as a way of bringing structural balance to your conversations. So thank you, Javi. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate this. Thank you so much, John. I really appreciate that. And I really actually feel called and inspired to expand on this. And uh, I, I actually have a few more, interestingly, um, martial artists and uh, Tai Chi and Qigong practitioners lined up, hopefully, to expand on this idea. A friend of mine um, noted the martial arts for peace uh, hashtag, so hopefully we can uh, use this as a, as a uh, stepping point to continue on the path of, of learning, as you uh, noted um, so that's a concept that I've, that I've had to contend with in terms of our, uh, perceived sec successes and failures. And it's the idea that we're all learning. I want to thank you for, uh, for, uh, coming in today and, and, and speaking with us. Um, this has been Chi Talks. I'm Javi. Thanks again, John.